Well, hello, everyone. This is Professor Khan. Uh, today, I wanted to just kind of walk you through the paper three assignment. Uh, it's been told to you, but I want to post it uh, along with this uh, presentation. And uh, of course, if you have any questions about this assignment, uh, please email me and let me know or, or visit during office hours. This is paper three, setting and narrator point of view. That's what POV stands for. Um, in the in time, uh, what I've done is I have combined paper three, which was originally just going to be about setting, and which was going to be about narrator point of view. And I've collapsed those two uh, things together into this paper. Uh, in the doing, I've also taken out a few other requirements that I had uh, for both papers. So hopefully this will be a good compromise. Um, the first thing I'll say is paper three is in many ways going to be very similar to paper two. Paper three, just like paper two, is going to pursue the formalist mission or the formalist project of examining and analyzing certain elements and connecting those elements to Corey's central idea. So just like in paper two, here in paper three, you will be engaging in some cause and effect argument in which you link uh, certain aspects of elements of fiction to your chosen story's central idea. Um, that's the primary similarity, papers two and three. Paper three is different in other ways. Um, paper three will introduce you to an approach for literary analysis called reader response and be using what we call reader response style in your issue and your conclusion. You will not be writing a plot like you did for paper one and two. Uh, and then the other primary difference is that paper three deals with different elements of fiction. So instead of writing about character and conflict like you did in paper two, paper three, you'll be writing about setting and narrator point. Now, there will be separate presentations and slideshows about reader response and setting and narrator point of view. So you will definitely want to uh, view those and study those slideshows, um, you know, as you're beginning the, uh, the note-taking and the uh, the early drafting process of paper three. We'll take a look at the summary of instructions first. This paper is going to identify a story's central idea. Then you will analyze how the story is setting and the narrator point of view choice help give rise to the central idea, help create that central idea of the reader. Uh, these arguments will be framed on the front end and the back end with a reader response, introduction, and conclusion. So you will want to, like I say, view those presentations about setting, point of view, and reader response. And I think it will be very prudent to go back into module one and review presentation about the central idea. Uh, I have added um, a bunch of other central idea examples to the running list of examples. That current list is sitting in module three right now. Uh, and I think you'll also want to go back into module two and review presentation about cause and effect argumentation. You might remember um, that uh, slideshow, that presentation on the story of an hour. 
paper three, you will have several stories to choose from. Um, I hope that you will read all of these stories, but you will only choose one to write about in paper three. This is an excellent collection of short stories. Um, and like I say, I hope you read them all. Uh, I will say that I chose these stories because they do offer a range of interesting and critical settings. They also represent the spectrum of narrow points of view that are available to us, at least for the most part. Uh, I will say that, you know, some of these stories are longer than others. I think the uh, Lahiri story, Maladies, which is just a great story, I think is the longest. Uh, Tim O'Brien's story, The Things They Carried, which some of them, I bet have probably read. It's a pretty common story to introduce to students in high school. Uh, that one's kind of long, too. Uh, Three Hills Like White Elephants is quite short. And Path is not too long. Um, but just because the story is shorter doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easier to write about. So please keep that in mind. All right. So in step one of paper three, you're going to write an introduction. Again, doing something a little different in this paper. You don't have to write a plot summary. Instead, you're going to write a reader response introduction. Well, I'm not going to go into detail about reader response. It is here. You should go to the presentation about reader response. Read the sample um, that I provide. And of course, there'll be additional sample reader response material in the sample paper three uh, once it's posted. But this will be one paragraph of reader response. So just a general definition of reader response is a reader makes sort of a very personal connection to a story. Um, example that I'll talk about a little bit in the response presentation, I write about an experience that I had that was similar to the experience that the protagonist of sharing my own personal experience uh, that mirror what happens in the story. That's one type of reader response. There are other types. Uh, generally speaking, we can sort of categorize reader response. We're associative. This is when we associate the story with our own lives, we write about similar experiences we've had, maybe we write about times when we have studied the story in other classes or on our own. Uh, maybe we write about how comparisons between the story and other stories we like or movies we like. Uh, those are all possible. Uh, there are other types of responses. Um, we can evaluate the story. That means basically giving it a review telling the readers, you know, whether or not you think the story is good or bad or leave being read or important or, or what have you. All possible reader response approaches. Um, the one thing you want to avoid doing in a reader response introduction is giving what we might call implication. And that is, you know, simply walking us through the story and explaining it you know, the way that, say, an English professor might, okay, uh, what I'll call the status quo analysis. So you don't really want to do analysis in a reader response unless your analysis is sort of a highly personal one. And again, all of those ideas are addressed in the reader response presentation. So the ultimate purpose of this introduction, as in any introduction, is to hook your readers get them interested early. So uh, this is sort of your chance to, you know, make, like I say, a personal connection to the story. And uh, at least from my perspective as a reader, 
I, I think those are always interesting to read. Now at the end, re response, whatever method you choose, or, or the response that you choose in your introduction, ultimately you're going to want to transition into the rest of your essay. So at the end of this first paragraph, find a way to bring up the story's title, the story's full name of the author, um, and then connect that or use that as a transition into your central idea statement. So nothing, nothing new here. Um, you're writing a central idea statement in the same way that you did for paper one and paper two. Like I say, I think it will help over all of you view the central idea presentation again and study the samples in module three. Then you'll move on into step two. Step two, you tackle setting first. So you write a paragraph in which you follow the pie pattern make a point, and you'll illustrate that point with examples from the text, and then you'll explain it yourself. So then we'll write a single topic sentence that simply asserts that there are multiple aspects of setting in the story. And this will hopefully be more clear to you when you view the setting presentation. Here in this sentence, you simply want to say that multiple dimensions of setting, multiple types, multiple aspects of settings, however you want to word that. Write it in your own way. This gives the paragraphs point. Now, there are ultimately four aspects of setting. So that's why I say this paragraph could be one paragraph long. No, I think that shouldn't be too much of a but you can certainly expand this outward into two paragraphs if you follow. You need the space to do that. So after you assert that there are multiple aspects of setting, you want to illustrate that. You want to prove it by giving textual evidence. And that course is going to be quotes, paraphrases, references to specific parts of the story. Now, the four aspects of setting, or the four uh, sides of setting, four ways that we think about setting, are place and location, time and duration, milieu, and mood and atmosphere. Again, all of these are going to be explained in the video present about setting. You need, in this paragraph, examples of all four aspects of setting. Now, it doesn't mean you have to bring up every example of setting. Some of those stories are going to have more aspects of setting than others. All of those stories will definitely have all four aspects of setting. But like, like I say, you don't have to write out an inventory of every aspect in the story that will take pages and pages and pages alone. Uh, all you need to do is give an example of each aspect of setting. All four aspects. Hit upon all four. So, again, I don't go into detail about setting here, but I do have a little sub about this. Setting of place or location could be the city that the story occurs in. It could be a room that the story occurs in. Um, the story of an owl, for instance, occurs mostly in a bedroom. Time could involve a time of day, noon, morning, twilight, could be a date, a specific date, could be a season, summer, winter, spring, could be a year. Duration could be a length of time. Again, I'll point to an hour. That takes an hour. 
duration of that story is an hour long. That's meaningful. So when we think of something, most people think about place and location, and they will think about time and possibly duration. But we want to go beyond that. We also want to talk about the story's milieu. Milieu refers to things like the setting of the story, uh, the cultural setting, perhaps the historical setting. So this could involve all kinds of possibilities, uh, cultural effects that are present in the story, uh, socioeconomic um, aspects of the story, uh, political, historical, ideological, a variety of possibilities here. And then finally, mood. Mood refers to sort of emotional atmosphere of the setting. So you want to, as you're reading, you want to sort of ask yourself, you know, what what sort of um, what sort of vibes do the setting does, does the setting give off for you? What what sort of emotions are generated by the setting? And we're talking you know, really about the emotions that you as a reader feel, rather than uh, what the characters might feel. And then the last pie is the explaining. You can't just let the evidence speak for itself. You have to explain. Well, I'm going to bring up this example of milieu. Here's the quote, and here's why this example of milieu. Because this quote indicates the economic status of the main character, for instance. Or this paraphrase that I just gave you um, Sort of summarizes the location where the story is taking place, etc. Explain yourself. Of course, you have four aspects of setting, so you're going to be kind of bouncing between giving the evidence as well as the explanation. And, you know, depending on how you write these out, these things could occur in the same sentence. During these experiments, you are free to consider other aspects of setting. Uh, for instance, how is, you know, so meaningful in the story? How does setting help to understand characters? I mentioned during character presentation that setting goes a long way toward characterizing. It can go a long way toward explaining um, the nature of characters to us. How, how do things or the aspects of settings help us understand, you know, the central conflict of the story? various themes in the story. So these are all kind of optional things that you can do to do this here in step two. But very quickly, you're going to want to move on to step three. And step three is where you will begin to connect the setting to your story's central. And of course, remember, um, you've got to get that central idea correct central idea is off base, if it's incorrect, if it is not taking the whole story into account, uh, if it's wrong in some other way, then that's going to sort of infect um, your step three. So you want to make sure that that central idea is pretty solid. So feel free to you know, email me your central idea for the story. I can give it the okay and, and also, feel free to work with tutors. This step three, as with all of these body patterns, are going to follow the pie pattern. With our point, our main point, in the form of a topic sentence, in which you state that the settings, or the aspects of setting, however you want to word it, help cause the central idea to emerge. Go ahead and you know, find your way of, of saying that if you wish. Uh, you can use this italicized phrase as well, that's fine. The settings help 
logical idea to uh, this is this paragraph's main point. And again, one or two paragraphs here in step three. Now you want to illustrate by giving textual evidence. Now, in step two, you provided a number of bits of evidence already, so you refer to these ideas. You don't need to recall them or re explain to us. But you're certainly welcome to bring up new evidence as well. Finally, you want to explain. And this, you know, explanation part in step three, and we'll do this again in step five, this is probably one of the trickier parts of this paper, just like it was in paper two. Here's where you need to explain how the information about setting that you wrote about in the previous step how this information helps contribute to this idea. You want to be your cause and effect argumentation skills here. How do the setting aspect lead us to or help to create the central lighting story? Again, go back to module two. Definitely view that cause and effect slide sharing and presentation. Make sure that your evidence that you chose in this paragraph supports the causal logic. Discuss the connections specifically. Don't imply ideas, but state them explicitly and explain yourself. It's going to mean Use a cause and effect words, as well as evoking and making direct references to the central idea of the story, and in fact, using the term central idea. If you're not doing that in this step, you're not doing this step correctly. All right, once we're done with step three, we move on to step four. Sort of leave setting behind, at least for now. And now we're going to identify the narrator and point of view of the story. One to two paragraphs. I pattern once again. We begin with a topic sentence that identifies the story's narrator and point of view. So kind of like in paper two, where you identified who the main character was, the protagonist. You identified what the conflict was and you used terms to do that. This is what you're doing here as well. Make sure to use those appropriate terms. And again, the narrative review presentation will go over these terms. There are options for a greater point of view, at least in terms of stories that we're dealing with, it will include the first person point of view, the person dramatic point of view, the third person limited omniscient point of view, and finally, the third person full omniscient point of view. We do, there are such things as second person point of view stories. We're not dealing with any of those in this case. will identify the point of view, the narrator point of view, or you've chosen to focus on for paper three, but you can't just state that and walk away. You've got to illustrate giving textual evidence that provides examples of the type of narrator point of view. That shouldn't be too hard to come up with. You want to make sure that you are doing this carefully, however, for instance, or you've chosen is a third person full omniscient. Well, a fully omniscient third person point of view story means that the story is kind of being seen through the eyes of more than one character. The narrator is outside of the story. The narrator gets into the heart or mind of more than one character. So you'll need to provide examples of more than one character. If, if your story
story is really a third person full of fully omniscient story. After you give that evidence, of course, explain yourself. Don't let the evidence speak for itself. Or the illustrations and the explanations might occur in the same sentence, certainly close together, but you might bounce back and forth between explanation and then some more evidence and then some more explanation. That's perfectly fine, as it's all there. In this explanation, in this analysis of narrator point of view, we want to go a little deeper and cover some other information about the narrator point of view question. So if your story is being told from a point of view, that means that the narrator is a character story. You want to write a little bit about whether or not that narrator is unreliable or reliable and why. If the story you've chosen is being narrated by a third person narrator, whether it's a dramatic third or a limited omniscient third or a fully omniscient third, see if you can say a little bit about how subjective or objective the narrator is in telling the story. How involved is the narrator? How interested, disinterested? the narrator in terms of what the character is doing and the events of the story. All concepts, all of these ideas are going to be explained in the narrator point of view slideshow. Uh, is the narrator relating them what happened in the past or relating them as they occur in the story? Does the narratorial stance change? The course of the story for any reason? What are some interesting two aspects to the narrator point of view that you find interesting or relevant? So tone, think of tone as the tone of voice of the narrator. You can I'm sure easily imagine an angry tone of voice or disinterested tone of voice or a uh, humorous tone of voice ironic tone of voice, etc. Narrator take on these different tones. So you might read a little bit about the tones that you see present in the story. As you're explaining why you believe the story is told from that particular view. Alright, then in five you will connect that narrative point of view to the central idea. Take one paragraph to do this, it should take you more than one. We'll follow the pie pattern once again. It's a single topic sentence that communicates the following idea. The narrator point of view helps cause the central idea to emerge. Remember what formalism Writer has made certain choices. The writer chose the story in a certain point of view. And that choice trickles down and helps to contribute to the central idea we the readers come to understand after reading the story. You want to illustrate this with textual evidence. Again, uh, you can refer back to stuff we brought up in the previous step. Then you need to explain how narrator point of view contributes to the central idea using your cause and effect logic. Make sure evidence supports your causal logic. And be able to discuss and explain your things specifically and carefully. Just in Step three, you will need to make direct references to the central idea. You will need to use the term central idea. And of course, you will need to use 
cause and effect keywords in order to really pin down the cause and effect logic. So one good way, or, or one possible way to do this, it's not the only way, but one, I think, good way to do this, is to, at some point in your execution here, in your cause and effect, um, hypothesize about how the central idea might change, or might be different, story had been written from a different narrator or point of view choice. So if you can imagine, say, the story of an hour, if it was told not from a third person, limited omniscient point of view, which it was written as, but instead written from a third person dramatic point of view, that means we would only see Louise Mallard's actions and what she says enter her mind at all. We wouldn't know what she was thinking directly, at least. That's a very different story we're talking about, I think. Uh, imagine if that story had been told from the first person point of view. Louise is narrating her own story. Same things happen, but the editorial choice the fly product very different and definitely affect the central idea of the story. So just consider that. Push yourself outside of the story a little bit. Imagine what it might like had it been told from a different point of view, and that might help you make those distinctions between point of view and central idea. You always want to consider the powers and the limitations type of point of view. Each type of point of view allows a certain level of access to the story. And some of those levels are more limited than others. Finally, step six, you will write a conclusion one paragraph in which you use, once again, reader response strategy. It might be helpful for you to the framing technique, so you uh, end say using the same kind of strategy that you began with. So let's say you uh, wrote an introduction in which you wrote a little story about yourself and how some experience of yours was very similar to something that you read in the story that you were working Well, maybe you finish that story here in the conclusion tell another similar story, or you can comment on that story. Uh, one pretty tough way to conclude using reader response uh, is to offer an evaluation or a review of the story. So I mentioned that earlier back in step one, you know, giving an evaluation of the story. That's certainly something you can do in the first paragraph, but it almost seems more logical to like that at the end of the story, or I'm sorry, the end of your essay. Uh, you know, you can offer a recommendation, whether or not the story is reading, why it's important, why it's important to read, uh, and, you know, be honest. I mean, if you didn't like the story, if you think the story doesn't have much to offer in the, in the, in the final analysis, be honest, say that. But, of course, you always have to explain why, why you think. You never want to summarize your own essay in your conclusion. You never, ever want to use the term in conclusion at the beginning of your concluding paragraph. We were all taught to do it back in earlier schooling, but now to move on. So we're not going to do that anymore. You do want to compose a works cited page that will only have the one entry, of course, the story that you're working on. Hopefully by now you will uh, have a better grip on how to compose this citation since you will have got or will be getting comments about your citation in page two. I will read this. The in-text citation is going to be a little clear. Most of you are using the digital textbook. And that textbook really does not have page numbers. It's not page numbers that you can easily discern. So 
I'm not going to require that you, you know, try to put in papers um, unless you're using a print book. If you're using a, a print book that has page numbers, then uh, you want you to, to include the page numbers in parenthetical sections at the end. So you want to cite, um, you know, anytime that you quote, anytime that you paraphrase a specific part of a story, anytime that you refer to a very specific part of the story. Uh, but since you're only using one source, and that's the story, uh, it's what you're referring to, so you don't have to keep repeating the author's name or anything like that. That will be, be pretty understood after your introduction. Just make sure that you go back into module three and take a look at your citation material. Uh, it's the same material that was in module one and module two. I'm just copying it over the modules. And of course, don't forget your formatting. My paper three, you should have formatting down. I, I do not want to see any formatting errors in paper three. Here I'm talking about double spacing, and your heading, and your title, and your page number. Make sure that you give your essay a title, a unique title. You know, Hemingway's Hills Like White Elephants. Or the Harry's Interpreter of Maladies. Don't just give his name and the title of the story. That's boring. Your title needs to be part of the hook. So try to give it a unique title. Finally, uh, you know, just to wrap it up, uh, once again, a cause and effect argument of a formalist type. Formalism says that we really need to understand too much, if anything, about the author or the time that the story was written. Now, I am going to say that because this paper deals with setting, um, it might be useful to understand a little bit about when the story was written or certainly when the story was set. Uh, so, for instance, if you're reading a Faulkner story and you have absolutely no idea what the American Civil War was about or what Reconstruction means, um, you're probably going to have a difficult time grasping the milieu of that story. Uh, if you, you know, really have no clue what's going on with civil rights in, in our history, some of these stories are, are going to be a little beyond you. So, formalism does say speaking, that we don't need to understand that stuff in order to analyze a story, but I'm going to contend that formalism is a beginning. It's not the beginning, but it's a beginning. And there we can expand and start taking into account some of these other greater contexts that will help us analyze and understand and enjoy the stories. Once again, um, do not go to the web in order to try to find material for your paper. I much rather you, you write an essay that needs revision and editing and assistance than you just write off a bunch of crap you found on the web. It's far more ethical to do that way. Already you know, had to reprimand a few students for doing some plagiarism in our earlier papers, and I don't want to have to do that again. So, if you need help standing a story, deciphering the settings, figuring out the points, we're trying to figure out how these things relate to central idea. You know, there's a reason why I teach this class. I love this stuff, so I'm happy to help you, but you need to ask me. Tutors, writing tutors, I think by and large are going to be familiar with these stories. So you can always ask them about them. And if you want to work with 
tutor. I right? know some of you have been doing that. Make sure to fill out the online form and the link is here at the bottom of the page. All right, so that's it. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions about paper three, please let me know.